It's my pleasure to introduce Marcus Jacobson, um, who will be giving the, the talk today. Uh, he's now working at PARC, uh, Palo Alto Research Center, uh, and he just joined there. He came from Indiana University, uh, and before that, RSA, before that, Bell Labs, and before that, he got his PhD at uh, UCSD. Uh, he always gives interesting talks, usually about uh, some kind of security and security relating to, to uh, the problems with those pesky users. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of those talks. And so, Marcus, thank you. Welcome. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, uh, inviting you all to interrupt me at any time if you want me to clarify or uh, elaborate on something or or just skip over something that is not as, exci as exciting as the other part. So please, let this be a very interactive talk. Um, and let me start by saying exactly um, why I'm doing this, and I'll come to explaining the title later. Um, the way I feel, this is the addressing the weak link right now, uh, where um, passwords are something that uh, people have started to get an idea of how to deal with, not to reuse passwords across sites and so on. But password reset questions, it's still something that is poorly understood, and uh, it becomes a meta password, pretty much. Uh, if you have the same password reset questions over several uh, sites, that is um, another password, in fact. And not only is it cross sites, but it's also over time for most kind of schemes. Uh, in particular, if, the, if it relates to your history, where you were born and what your mother's maiden name, you can't really change it. Um, many people, especially technically minded people, say, well, you could, because you could lie. And that's a good point, but uh, it's actually irrelevant for uh, a large segment of the population, because it becomes another password then. If you lie at any time, uh, then you've created a, a password that you need to remember. And you have to deal with a system like this because you forgot your password in the first place. So uh, having to remember another password when you've forgotten the first one that you use more often, it's just not the right approach. So this is dealing with the problem of what you do when you have forgotten the password. Um, so looking at the trends, I think it's clear that people are going to forget passwords more. Um, the first reason is that uh, there are more sites, and hopefully that means that there are more passwords. And it's going to become harder to remember all of these many passwords if you don't have uh, a tool, which not everybody does, to keep them. And if you do, you're tying yourself down to a machine, of course. Uh, or if you have a very clear structure, in which case you introduce a security vulnerability. Um, also, credentials um, are going to be used um, Credentials that are reused are going to be more vulnerable. Uh, and password reset questions, of course, is one of those that uh, becomes very interesting for hackers and fishers to get. And there's already evidence of this. Um, I spoke to um, a representative of a large uh, company around here that said that in order to buy credentials for our users of that company, it costs a dollar on the black market. Except if you want the password reset questions too, then it costs $15. And the reason is clear. Uh, they're long-lived. Um, when people change their password, they don't change these. And also, they have value outside the site. Um, so here's a bunch of typical questions that uh, are used. Uh, name of sister's best friend, mother's maiden name, your high school, city of birth, make of your first car, name of first pet, and driver's license number. These are common. None of them are really good. Uh, so let me. Uh, Pick them apart one by one. So make of your first car. It's pretty easy to say, well, maybe it's a common car, and maybe it's not such an expensive car. Ford is a good one. It has uh, a very large market share. Um, first name of your best friend, it's not a good one, because some names are just more common than others. And this is the kind of thing that you could find information about on social networks. You could just assume that somebody who writes on uh, the Facebook wall of a particular person might be uh, the best friend, at least at that particular time. The, the other reasons that why this is not a good question, um, best friend change. And, um, and it, it's, it should be long-lived. Uh, first name of sister's best friend is actually even worse. Um, not only do you have to remember it, but uh, what if you don't have a sister? So many of the questions are phrased in a way that maybe there is no answer. 
Um, name of the first or favorite pet? Seems like a very good question at first. Uh, but then, of course, not even talking about uh, records at vets and local groomers, uh, there's the risk of reuse between different people. And in fact, there are uh, lists of common pet names online that makes it pretty easy to strike a large segment of the population and get a, a reasonable percentage right. Um, mother's maiden name, um, it doesn't work very well. Uh, a student of mine and I published a paper a few years ago about how easy it is to derive from public records uh, what mother's maiden name is. Uh, we decided to select Texas as a choice, both because uh, there's a large number of uh, uh, Texans and their public records that are pretty good and because my student has some beef with, with Texas. So um, that, that was our example. And also, they're demographically more representative than California. It could have been done for California just as well, but it would not apply to the greater population, the US population, in the, to the same degree. So that shows that um, with a very high certainty, you can get at least 15% of the population um, their mother's maiden name. So these are bad questions for many reasons. Um, also, people forget. And of course, you are here in a system like this because you have forgotten. You're already stressed about having forgotten. So a trivial fact that you normally would not forget, you might not be able to remember it at this time. Uh, name of the street you grew up on, even though you might not forget this, you might have forgotten what street you entered when you set it up. You might have grown up on two or three streets. Which one was the one? What was the correct spelling? What was the spelling you used before? Did you write ST or street? Um, name of the best friend I mentioned before, it could change. Uh, city you were born in, there's a representation problem. What was the representation you entered before of this? And of course, um, an attacker who would like to have um, a fair chance would just try the main metro metropolitan areas for a given victim, or the same area where the victim is known to live now and hope that that is right. Um, and then the problem of uh, people lying to increase the security, that actually uh, decreases the uh, usefulness of the system in general. And it increases the cost. This is a very expensive proposition to many companies um, with uh, over $20 average for um, a customer rep initiated or um, supported reset. So automated resets are important in the industry to, to perform. And, um, but at the same time, they expose security problems to, to the companies. Uh, and the, the curve you see up here is uh, what's called a forgetting curve. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to cite uh, research from uh, the late 1800s in, in this paper uh, that, that supports this talk. Um, there is uh, a German researcher who uh, looked at what people forget. And his conclusion is pretty straightforward, that people forget uh, strange information more easily that they, than they forget information that seems to apply to their lives. Now, passwords often are, a good password is often strange information. Um, it's, uh, especially if it's assigned to you. So um, according to that principle, people would forget uh, things more of this type. So um, there's a good recent Soup's paper on the taxonomy of problems. Um, so the, one of the problems is uh, it's inapplicable. It's a question that uh, you cannot answer. Um, and therefore, it's just a matter, it's a frustration when you set the system up that the, there are questions that just do not apply to you. So what high school did your spouse attend? Uh, well, most people apply high, uh, attend high school, but not everybody has a spouse. Um, there is the not memorable question, name of your teacher in kindergarten. I would not be able to answer what my kindergarten teacher's name is. Some of you might. Uh, then you're remarkable. Um, ambiguous question, name of the college you applied to but did not attend. That, at first, seems like a great thing because there are no public records of it. Um, but what if you applied to more than one uh, that you didn't attend? It happens. And uh, you'd have to remember the same one, not only one of them. Um, guessable, age when you uh, married and favorite color. There are great examples of that. It's fairly predictable, the age at which a person marries. You know, 25 is much more common than, say, 65. 
And favorite color, there aren't that many colors. And uh, people would pick red or blue or green or something, one of the standard colors, uh, not rust beige or you know, whatever weird color you might imagine. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of questions that are either attackable or automatically attackable. So um, that's the kind of question that um, a company called Varied right now uses. Um, if you call your online banking or 401k, uh, service to, to reset your password, chances are that you'll have to answer questions about streets and uh, counties that you've lived in and where you own property. And it's very easy to uh, find public records about this. In fact, that is how these questions were derived. The company that provides the service goes out and takes all the public, public records, compile huge databases of it, and asks people who want to reset their password for the answers. And anybody who could do the same thing, of course, could also answer the questions. Um, and these aren't very difficult questions to, to answer if you have ac access to a search engine. Um, so the intuition uh, of how to approach this problem is uh, you shouldn't rely on uh, long-term memory if you could help it, uh, but instead use preferences. So preferences are not documented to the same extent as uh, long-term memorable things, facts are. And also, since it doesn't have to be remembered, the forgetting curve does not apply. These aren't things that you have to specifically uh, keep. It's you. You know these things because it is how you are. Um, also, preferences are known to be stable over time, which is a good thing. Uh, you might argue that some of the, your preferences change over time, but not all of them. And uh, you could keep a you could build a scheme that um, ensures that as long as you don't change too many preferences over time, you recognize that the person you were when you set it up. Also, preferences are rarely documented. And now, people might uh, observe that uh, a lot of people scream out their preferences on social network sites. Uh, but that's a kind of preferences that you could avoid. For example, favorite rock star is a preference that people might feel like they want to express uh, on their Facebook site. But whether they like uh, you know, Korean food or not is not quite as likely to be on their uh, Facebook site. And dislikes are even less uh, likely to be there, especially uh, lukewarm dislikes. You know, things you'd rather not do than doing, but you, know, you wouldn't die if you had to do it. Um, so this is a screenshot of the, uh, the setup for the system. And uh, you could uh, go and play around with this if you want to. It's, uh, if you type I forgot my password.com hyphen between each word, then you get an explanation how the system works. And then you could go to this. This is called bluemoonauthentication.com hyphen again between uh, all of the words. The reason for, for the name choice, Blue Moon Authentication, is that uh, hopefully you will only have to reset your passwords once in a blue moon. And you should succeed then. And this is the setup. So what you do here is um, there's a number of topics, six topics here, uh, sports, places, music, food, TV, and interests. And those are categories that are uh, randomly ordered. So not everybody gets them in this order. And then in each category, there's a number of uh, things that you could express a preference for. And again, these are randomly ordered. So uh, that is to avoid bias of always the same view of different people doing the setup. And here you could say whether you like doing yo yoga by pressing on the like button or you dislike it. And skating, playing golf, playing billiards or pool and so on. You could express your preferences here. And by doing that, you populate these two boxes here, the likes and the dislikes. This is what you do during setup of the system. And that takes about two minutes for the average uh, user. Now, some people at first uh, express a little bit of frustration because None of these might be extreme preferences. You know, when people think of likes and dislikes, they think love and hate. But that's not what we want, because those are uh, much easier to anticipate. But these are expected to be lukewarm preferences, where you should think, do I slightly prefer it, or do I slightly prefer not to do it? We got music in the background, too. And then when you re want to reset your password, uh, you come to a screen that looks very much like this, where the uh, topics here are the things that you've already chosen. For example, it says cars, watch soccer, gospel music, punk music, and so on. And you have to say whether you like or dislike 
each one of them. Now, these are things that you already expressed a preference for. So notice here that you don't have to uh, remember which ones you selected during the setup. You only have to take the list of things that were, you had a preference for, whether like or dislike, and say which one was it. So the only thing that you have to do is to think, do I slightly more like than dislike, or vice versa, for each one of these? And if you, your score is above the threshold here, then you succeed, and you have authenticated, and now you could reset your password. And of course, this has applications beyond password reset. You could say that if you want just a little bit more assurance that the person is who he claims to be for a particular transaction to be carried out, then you could ans ask two or three of these questions to boost your assurance. And if the person answers are largely correct, then you know, that's the extra score needed. So behind the user interface, this is what happens. You get a small reward for each uh, correct answer, and uh, you get a much larger punishment for each uh, incorrect answer. Um, and the exact balance between these uh, can be made in a way that m maximizes your chances of uh, correctly logging in, even if you make a couple of few mistakes, whereas it minimizes the attacker's chances of doing it. Um, and so then it compares to uh, a personal threshold um, that corresponds to when you set, when you set things up. And um, also, the size of the rewards and the punishment, they depend on the, um, on the entropy for the distributions of the answers that you expressed an interest for. They, they don't all have the same entropy, and a question with a slightly higher entropy would give a little bit more score, because the risk is greater for an adversary who picks the wrong, the wrong answer there, and your benefit should be slightly larger too. So before I can go on and really talk about the security, I need to talk about who is the adversary here. Uh, so the faceless enemy on the web is the most prominent adversary. They could either be what we call a naive adversary, who will just uh, get the list of questions and select at random. Select the right number of likes and dislikes, but doesn't know anything about the distribution. Doesn't care. And it might seem uh, strange why we would care about such a, such a str dumb and limited adversary, when, after all, he might know something about the distributions and care about it. But actually, if you look at most phishing attacks today, they're of this kind. They're not maximized for uh, success. Instead, uh, they're maximized for being simple to perform. The fisher would rather target twice as many victims rather than working a little bit harder and getting it right and making it more convincing. There's not a strong trend towards uh, brilliant attacks. The general trend is not. So with, even though this is uh, a limited adversary, it makes sense to consider. Uh, the st strategic adversary is an adversary who knows distributions. So we assume that the distributions that we know about the questions and the answers are distributions that the adversary know too. And they, uh, the adversary will maximize his or her chances of success based on those distributions, but doesn't know anything about the victim in particular. And then the second kind of adversary here is the acquaintance, friend, or family member. And to evaluate that, we have performed tests where we asked people to uh, impersonate one of the, one of their acquaintances, friends, or family members. Now, family members do very well at impersonating. In fact, my wife got a higher score than I did, um, and so I guess it goes to prove something, I guess. So I'm not sure what. Um, but acquaintances got a lower score than um, the strategic adversary. The acquaintances know a person, but doesn't have all the distributions, and they have to just make a pretty good guess. Uh, they were worse off. And the friend, reasonably close friends fell somewhere in between. Uh, we, uh, we performed these experiments, and there was um, a recently engaged couple who participated in trying to uh, impersonate each other. And we had qualms for the longest whether we should tell them that um, maybe it's not going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> they did not do very well. Um, they had no idea who the other person was. The worst attack that uh, we know of is what we call the ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend attack. This is a person who knows a lot about you and who is malicious. Um, and um, <laughs> I, let me tell you that it's not good news. Uh, but these very strong attacks, like the family member, the ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend attack, they're not the typical attacks out there. 
they're not what the you know, Bank of America and PayPal worry about, because that's not where they lose most of the money. In fact, even though uh, identity theft uh, performed by family members is a very common kind of attack, it's very easy to resolve. The money is shipped off to an address that it's, it's obvious whom it belongs to, and, or goods are ordered to that address, and it's very easily resolved. Uh, family members don't necessarily make very good criminals. So from a commercial point of view, uh, even though attacks by family members or ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend might seem like a worrisome thing, commercially speaking, it is not such a worrisome thing as the faceless adversary on the web. Um, what is worrisome, though, is uh, the website cloning attacker. So imagine that you wanted to know my Bank of America credentials or PayPal credentials, doesn't matter. You set up a system which you don't try to impersonate one of those sites. You might have a car cartoon website or news feed or something like that. And you ask me to, you know, if I want to uh, have my uh, preferences registered or if I want to use the premium version, then I need to set up an account. And then I, of course, need to answer password reset questions. The questions you ask me are exactly those that are asked by the company you would like to get access for my account for. So you know those questions beforehand, of course. Um, and that's what, what I refer to as the website cloning attacker. It doesn't clone the whole website, but it clones the particular questions. Now it knows the answers to those questions. And now you, the uh, evil attacker, you have the answer. You could reset my question, my password, potentially. So the results that I'm going to talk about are backed up by a bunch of experiments. Um, the first experiment was uh, to use a little bit more than 400 college students and ask them lots of questions about what they prefer and not prefer to do. And we, from this, we ruled out some uh, really bad questions that were obvious from a large population, from, from this population, that they were not going to help, be helpful. For example, do you like to watch TV? Not a good one. Most people said yes, and so it's, it's obvious that uh, an attacker would say yes in this case. Um, this is actually the time I could explain the title for the talk, uh, Love and Authentication, uh, because what we did was we asked, the questions we asked people were questions that we scraped from online dating sites. Our gut feeling was that people who register there, they don't really register things of their long-term memory, like where they lived and, and so not, in order to be matched with their potential mate. It's just not relevant. But they would ask, answer questions that relate to who they are and how they are. And so we took all of those questions. We removed the obvious bad ones, like uh, do you have a tattoo on your back, and, and things that should not be asked to uh, a bunch of college students unless you want to you know, not have a tenured position anymore. Um, there are some dating sites that are pretty explicit. Um, so we asked the, a bunch of questions that were still considered reasonably secure to ask, and then we weeded out those that were bad. So bad questions being uh, low entropy. We kept uh, almost 200 of these questions. And then uh, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk in a very similar fashion. We asked people to express preferences. And now we could use much more people. We used uh, more than 1,000 Turks in order to rate questions and also to set up things using this interface. They did the setup and the authentication. And uh, we could observe the distributions for the various things. Oh, I'm sorry. So Mechanical Turk is um, it's an online forum where people can perform small tasks task for a small reward. So for example, if you have a huge number of photos and you would like them all to be turned in the right direction, you might put them up as tasks where somebody who would like to say how to, to turn the photo in order for it to be correct would earn one or two cents. And so what we did was that we put up tasks where people expressed their preferences um, and then they registered, and then they did the authentication for, for a large number of users. In order to, uh, it it's pretty much duplicates um, uh, normal uh, human subjects tests, but it's much faster to perform. Um, you could easily get 1,000 results in a day or two if, you, uh, if you're willing to pay enough. 
And in this context, pay enough means 26 cents per, per user. It's remarkably inexpensive, too. So it's a good way of performing usability experiments. Uh, and in addition, we emulated a large number of users. So we created um, what you might think of as uh, artificial profiles from the distributions we already have observed from other users, just in order to have a much larger user set. And we uh, verified that these are um, statistically similar to uh, the actual real profiles. And we did that because we needed a very large number of uh, profiles in order to get uh, statistical accuracy for the false positives estimates. So when we did this, we asked people to set up, and then immediately afterwards, we asked them to authenticate. In a real system, that would never happen, of course. You would authenticate and answer the questions when you have lost your password. But we did it just to verify that the, quest that the topics that people selected first were not selected at random. Especially on Mechanical Turk, you'd have to assume that some number of people just click in order to go get those 26 cents. And it doesn't matter what they click on. So what we did was we did not allow people to go back and see what they had selected before. But immediately after they did the setup, we asked them to perform the authentication to see if they were reasonably close to what they had expressed. This was to weed out people who obviously cheated. And you could see here, um, there's some people who got 13 out of 16 right, a bunch who got 14, 15, most of them got all of them right. And the red line here is the threshold that we would have required if this were a real authentication. So you, actually, we were very surprised that there were no, no cheaters at all. Um, we had expected a much larger number of people who would behave not so ethically just in order to get the small reward. So that was a good surprise. Uh, now, when we... But how many people actually dropped out? Beg your pardon? I see. Okay, so the question is how many people started the survey or the uh, setup of authentication but did not complete it? That was a very, very small number of them. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but it was maybe uh, 10 or 20 out of those 1,000 users. So, um, which the reason was probably that it was a fairly simple task to carry out, and um, many of the subjects seemed to think that it was interesting. We got lots of requests for follow-up experiments, and they wanted to be notified if we were going to run more studies of this kind. So we got the feeling that people actually liked to, to do this. Um, it's not as dry as many other systems, and they felt like, hey, they were helping science, because we explained what it was for. Uh, now, this is the, uh, showing some of the results. We used SurveyMonkey to ask people about their preferences. And this is the, um, the printout from SurveyMonkey. You could see here that uh, this is the like column here, the first column. Uh, this is the no opinion column, and this is the dislike column for various questions. Uh, the, the top question here is reggae, and there's a 43% uh, like. There's a 27% no opinion, which means that it wasn't selected uh, or it was um, um, kept in the no opinion, and 29% dislike. So if you compare the like and the dislikes, you'll see that there are more likes than dislikes. There's an imbalance. So that lowers the entropy here. It's somewhat easy to guess for a random subject that they will like reggae. Uh, there's almost twice or a third as many um, people who like reggae than dislike reggae. So reggae is not the greatest question, but it's not a bad one. Uh, you could see liking folk music or disliking folk music, 36% like it, 34% dislike it. So this is, in fact, a really good question. It's, uh, if you only know that I have selected folk music, but you don't know anything about me, then it's almost equal chances that I like it and I dislike it. Um, jazz, it's a pretty bad question. 47% of people like jazz, 25% of people dislike jazz. Now, this is for the population that we ask to participate, you might argue. But uh, independent studies show that this is a fairly representative population of the uh, US population in general, except for that there are more women on Mechanical Turk than uh, in real life, as a proportion, at least. Um, we don't quite know why. Um, it's exciting. It's the place to go if you want to date, I guess. Um, 
So then uh, this is to chart the entropy of the questions as we figured out from this previous uh, graph. Um, so there are some questions that are just horrible. And those are, of course, questions that we want to avoid including in a real password authentication scheme. Uh, then there are some, a whole lot of questions that are, oops, sorry, that are pretty decent. They're up on this plateau. Those are the questions we want to keep. Then uh, you could look at correlation between questions. So we did pairwise correlation. And we saw that there are some that are very, very correlated. Uh, for example, garage uh, sales and flea markets. Anybody who likes either is very, very likely to like the other. So that's, those two questions should not both be included. We have to remove one of them. Uh, if people enjoy political events and politics, that similarly had a very high correlation. You know, that should not surprise us, and we were silly for not catching that before. So this was really a weeding stage, where we removed the questions that turned out not to be suitable in combination. Uh, you could see, though, that most of them over here have very small correlation. Uh, there's a remarkably small number of them with negative correlation. Uh, but as you see here, the negative correlation is not very strong, and you could largely uh, ignore that in terms of the, the effect it has on the system. So this is uh, the worst questions to ask. This is just uh, a selection. So on top, it's political events and politics, and then flea markets and garage sales. These are the kind of things that we had to remove. On the bottom here, there's racing motocross and motorcycles. Um, I guess there's no, there shouldn't be any big surprises in this list. Uh, there are things that when you look at them, you say, yeah, I guess if you like this, then you like the other one too. Uh, but the best way, of course, is for us to just throw all the questions in there and see what comes out, which ones turn out to be good and not so good. Um, those with slight um, negative correlation, easy listening and punk, it, it should not come as a huge surprise that people don't typically like both of them. Um, watching reality shows and folk, that's a little bit more of a surprise to me. Um, and watching reality shows in bookstores, you know, these are things that you might want to throw out one of them uh, just in order to avoid the negative correlation there. Shows up three times. I know. Maybe you should throw out watching reality shows for that reason. <laughs> it's a thing that people uh, have strange correlation. I don't know. Um, so, so that's an interesting list just to, for the weeding purposes. And then. Um, you have things with remarkably low uh, correlation, like watching reality shows and motorcycles. Almost no correlation at all. Um, so those are questions that it doesn't matter if you ask them together. Uh, it's not going to behoove an attacker at all uh, knowing the correlation here. Uh, and this is just a heat map of the, all the pairs of correlation. Uh, so yellow is really bad and red is kind of bad, uh, dark red and blackish uh, means a good question or a good set of questions to ask. Uh, in addition to this, one could perform a vector analysis where uh, you, you'd look at clusters of questions. Uh, and that's work that is ongoing right now, not only to look at pairwise correlation, but also try to uh, see if you like A and B, then you're more likely to like C as, as well. Um, but this goes towards defending against an attacker that is much more powerful, really, than what we believe is necessary. But it's good to extrapolate and understand still, of course. Uh, so the experiments, in the experiments, we want to measure both false positives and false negatives. The false negatives are done by actual user experiments where people set up, and then after some time, um, long enough that it's not maintained in short-term memory, they come back and they express their preferences according to the authentication system. Um, and then they're um, given a score. And um, so this was run after two weeks uh, after the authentication. And uh, we did a relatively small number of uh, people for this one. But it was large enough that we could see that um, there wasn't really any problem. Uh, the, people did not change over that course of time the preferences as they had expressed them before. And then we're uh, falling back on psychology research that shows that, in general, people don't change preferences very much over longer periods of time. And then uh, we looked at the false positives. Uh, the strategic adversary got less than half a percent if we ask 16 questions. Um, and if the naive adversary, the adversary only 
guesses at random. That, that's much easier to anticipate what that would be because you could even, uh, you know, you don't need to perform the experiment to say that. And that is close to 0%. Um, and these are plots that show for various thresholds here on the x-axis, what is the false negative, uh, what is the false positive for the strategic and for the naive. And, and you could see here, for most thresholds here, that's very low. And there's a bump up here, and it goes up to between 2 and 3% if you set the threshold too high. So of course, that means the threshold of what is an acceptable score uh, should be set somewhere around here. And uh, this curve over here is the precision of the false positive rates. And that's where we needed the emulated users, because it turns out that in order to get um, significance and uh, to get a high precision, you need a very large number of users, um, towards 49,000. And we could not have so many actual user profiles. And that's why we supplemented our actual user profiles with the emulated user profiles, uh, which is a little bit of a stretch, but it's only in order to get an understanding for the, uh, for the accuracy of the false positive rate. So we could say, with a reasonable likelihood, what we have here is representing reality. So um, these, of course, they represent the strategic and the naive adversaries. They do not represent the family members and the ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend attacks. Those, as I mentioned, are much worse. But those also, I should mention, could be dealt with uh, in orthogonal manners. For example, many of uh, the deployed schemes require, in addition to knowing the answers to the questions, that you need to access uh, your email account. Uh, a link is sent out to your email account, and then you would have to, um, to follow that link and then answer the questions. And that makes it harder, even for insiders, to do it. Now, that is also a usability vulnerability because people change email accounts uh, sometimes fa faster and more frequently than they access accounts. For example, your 401k account, you might not access it more than every two or three years, and you might change email accounts more often. Um, so the conclusion here is that preferences, um, they don't change dramatically and very quickly. They uh, change very slowly. And that's something that we could leverage on. And we could get uh, really good error rates and using a practical interface. Now, I haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, imagine doing password reset for the traditional schemes on an iPhone. You'd have to type in the name of the, st the, the street you grew up on or their mother's maiden name. It's a, it could be a frustrating experiment, uh, experience. Whereas uh, clicking boxes, it's much easier. And you could even have a voice-driven interface where you simply just, on the phone, say yes, no, yes, yes, or press one and two. So the user interface is more appealing for the approach that we suggest here. Um, and then you could also have orthogonal security techniques to deal with insiders. Uh, the background here is, the faded background is uh, a forget-me-not flower, by, by the way. Yeah, it's probably not very visible, but uh, uh, you know, if I start with uh, one flower, I have to end with another one, I guess. And um, so I, before I end and open up to questions, I want to uh, recognize the, uh, the help and the participation I've gotten from a lot of other researchers who've been involved in this project since it started. This is a, a project that has been going on for a little bit more than two years. And uh, there's been a crew of HCI people, security people, and uh, psychologists involved in one way or another in developing this. You could read more if you go to www.iforgotmypassword.com. You could try it out on bluemoonauthentication.com. And uh, of course, you could contact me with questions uh, at marcusjacobson.park.com. So I have time for questions. Yes, Dark. So the data that you show where if you pick the threshold at, I forget, like 55, 60% or something, and you essentially have zero false negatives. That, after what time that was measured with users? So false, you're saying false positive or false negatives? Uh, you had no false negatives, right? That was the, fal the false negatives is when actual users having registered, uh, they log into the system and they succeed to log into the system. How long, how long after they set up the system did you? Did you so the question is, 
How long after the setup did they perform the authentication? Uh, around two weeks. It, not, ev not all the subjects were exactly two weeks because there's the, uh, the practical issues of getting people in and performing the experiment. But um, I believe 12 to 16 days, almost all of them. And so that was the time that a psychologist suggested would be a good, uh, good approximate time. Because you want to make very sure that nothing is stored in short-term memory. Obviously, nothing is going to be retained that long in short-term memory. Um, and just to be sure, we make it much longer um, than what's necessary. And so that's the two-week span. Uh, that should have rather similar um, results as if we had waited a year, we believe. Um, of course, we'd have to, to try the, the same experiments in, uh, after a longer time to really assert that this is true. Um, and it might be that the score would degrade over time to a certain extent. And that could be uh, taken into consideration in the policy mechanism that decides what is a passing score. You had a question? So a strategic adversary would have a, you said, 0.5% success rate. Uh, what would their success rate be if they were attacking normal password reset questions? The question is, uh, if you compare the uh, success rate of a strategic adversary, who in this scheme has a 0.5% probability of success, what would they have, uh, what's their probability of success using normal questions? Um, that is somewhat harder to measure, for sure, um, you know, without doing it. <laughs> um, I could say that, for example, using uh, mother's maiden name as the reset question, and um, falling back on the research I mentioned earlier on relating to Texas, there we would get a 15% uh, success rate. For 15% are the portion of people we know for sure. And then about another 10% we know with a very big likelihood. We know that there are only two or three choices. And so the question then becomes, how many tries would the adversary get in order to uh, do this? The numbers I've reported on here is for one try. The analysis gets much more complex if you let the adversary have three tries, for example, because the best strategy would take into consideration uh, the distributions, of course, and, and try to maximize the chances. Um, so my answer, I'm trying to avoid answering it because I can't answer it. Uh, we cannot know with certainty what the false uh, positive rates are for the ex existing schemes. We just know of the obvious vulnerabilities and um, if you, were to, if you were to pick one particular scheme, like the one where you have to say, uh, out of these four addresses, which one have you lived on? Um, I could say with a very high probability, it would be beaten uh, for any given person, just because of the public records you get for doing a white pages search. And uh, then you would have to answer a follow-up question about what counties you have lived in but that only ta requires that you do a little bit more work to see what, what counters were those addresses. In. So it, for a reasonably dedicated attacker, it doesn't take much at all. Um, so don't make me say the percentage, but I would say it's more likely to be beaten than not for a given person. Yes? I also think the kind of questions used here are more common for people all over the world while questions like your mother's maiden name would be totally different in the US and totally different in, say, China. Yes, no. The point is that th this might be useful in other countries. Uh, uh, and it's true. In certain countries, mother's maiden name for sure is not a meaningful thing to ask for authentication. Say, China or Korea, where there's, uh, it's fairly obvious what your mother's maiden name is because there's only four or five common last names. It's not a good authentication question. Um, now, it does. The, the, the selection of questions does uh, have a cultural uh, correlation. Um, you could ask people in the US, for example, if they like baseball or not. And that might be a reasonably good question. But in Europe, it might not be such a good question at all. And, and you don't want to ask uh, people in India whether they like cricket or not, because the answer is going to be obvious. So you'd have to do a similar kind of screening of questions um, per, on a per country basis. Now, it does have other benefits. Uh, for example, in Europe, there are very strict, there's very strict regulation about what kind of questions um, 
or what kind of data you're allowed to store about people. Uh, you need permits for, for storing pretty much anything. Preferences excluded. Uh, if you like sushi or vegetarian food, and if you want to tell me, I could store that, and that is not a problem. So in countries where the laws and the uh, adherence to the law is very strict, um, Germany has been brought up an ex as an example, um, this is a good approach, because people don't feel bad about it, and there is no um, legal requirements for it. Yes? So as far as your user usability exper experiments in terms of the false negative rate, um, were the experiments conducted under the assumption that this was their primary authentication mechanism, or did they have to set a password, and were, they under the were the users under the impression that this was a secondary authentication mechanism? Okay. Because I can imagine that would affect the false negative rate. Okay, the question is, um, did the users think that this was their primary or secondary authentication method when we performed experiments to back up the, um, um, the false negatives? And um, in fact, they didn't know why they were doing it. Um, we, we wanted it to be realistic, uh, but if we say that you do this to reset access to something you really need, that corresponds to a very strong incentive to do things right. But if we try to give a similar, very strong incentive for uh, people participating in the subject and say, if you get the answers right, then we'll give you 50 bucks, then we know that there, people are going to leave Exactly, they're going to write it down. And so uh, then we're not measuring the truth anymore. So we had to be very careful. What we did was we performed two sets of experiments. In the first one, um, subjects took the uh, first part of the test, the authentication, and then came back after two weeks and they had no particular instructions. In the second group, they were do did this, exactly the same thing, but as they came back, after two weeks, they were told that if you score about the 50% of people who have the highest score, you get another five bucks. So some of them who had already cheated in the first phase because they thought that this was a meaningless exercise that allowed them to get a couple of dollars, they were not able to do that in the second phase. Um, and of course, when we saw that it was obvious from a person's participation that they were cheating, uh, they were considered outliers. So if somebody said they like everything because the buttons are aligned and it's easier to click like for everything, then we say this is not a subject uh, who is participating in the study and we, we remove them. It would have to be realistic answers. But we could never say if a random clicking would be realistic or not. And so when we gave people the incentive of thinking hard what they really feel like, we saw that the, uh, the success rates improved, uh, not dramatically, but a little bit. So it means that if you, if you know that this is valuable to do it right, you're going to do better. And so uh, this is a lower bound in some way. We, we know that people are going to do better than we thought. And so our false positive um, is a, an upper bound. Well, it seems silly to say that zero is an upper bound, but it's just about where we put the threshold and how we balance things. Yes, Phil. OK, the question is, what if this gets accepted everywhere, and would you guys have to type in the preferences for every bank site? Uh, first of all, if it gets accepted everywhere, I'd be very pleased. Um, but that's a kind of an orthogonal issue. Um, how you maintain this, if you do it in a federated sense or not, uh, that's really uh, that's another question. It could be kept by one company that knows your preferences and then just sends an okay to the other companies, uh, or it could be kept in a distributed fashion. And now remember, if you, you go back to the uh, website cloning attacker, that's an attacker who knows something about you because they ask the same questions. That is actually not such a likely attack for the system. Because remember, the topics that you're asked about during your legitimate setup and the order of them, and the order of uh, the categories. It's going to be random. And there's a very large number of things that you could select. If I represent an attacker, and I would like to capture your answers, it's a very, very unlikely event that I would be able to pose you with the same questions and have you respond. 
So there, there are two obvious ways of dealing with this. One is um, to ask you all the questions, 500 questions if we have them, ask you to answer all of them. That should make people suspicious and bored. The other one is to perform a man-in-the-middle attack, where you go to the authentication stage. You see what are the questions asked of this person, and then you ask them to answer only those questions. Uh, that is, in one sense, it's a more powerful attack. But it's also an attack that is easier to de detect. Any active man in the middle who goes somewhere would leave IP traces. And also, uh, if they want to do it for a reasonable number of victims at any time, if you think of it as a phishing attack, the peak of requests would be making it a very obvious attack. So uh, that's not a, such a big problem from a practical point of view. Yes? Let's say Plan A has a pool of 500 questions, and they ask you to pick, I don't know, 20 of them and declare whether you like something or not. Then if an attacker wants, wants to impersonate you, he can just show the same pool of questions and probably you would pick the same uh, questions and the same answers because okay. you feel strongly about something. You don't know. Okay. So the question is, say that bank A uh, poses you with 500 questions and you select 20 of them. An attacker wants to know uh, what, what your answers are. He would just pose you with the same 500 questions. Now, th this is where the randomized order comes in. Um, there are going to be much, much more than 20 things that you have a preference for, whether like and dislike. And um, it, the attacker is not going to get a consistent selection. But also, whereas there might be 500 questions, there are not going to be 500 questions available for a given user at any one time. So if you come to the system, you might have six categories with 12 in each. These are populated from the 500 questions at random. If the attacker hopes to set this up again, he would have to take another selection from the 500. Or, again, have um, a very different user experience where the user is um, inundated with questions or forced to answer many more. And that should make people aware of it. But there's also, the, and there's always the, the question, will people understand that they're being defrauded? And um, we don't know. Yes? So after you remove the low-entropy questions and the high-entropy ones, how many are left? OK, the question is, after we remove the uh, low-entropy and the highly correlated questions, how many were left? Uh, currently, I believe we have uh, 120 questions that are good. Um, this might seem uh, silly, but it's a very exciting area of research, really, to develop new questions, I think. Right now, I have condiments. Uh, I challenge you to guess what good entropy condiment questions are. Um, not ketchup. Um, so you could expand, you could improve the security by expanding the number of categories and select the right kind of items of these. And uh, using this approach, we hope to have a couple of hundred of very good questions uh, within too long, before too long. Yes? So just get the numbers. You have about a couple hundred questions. You ask the user to, out of around 80 questions, you ask the user to identify 20. And do you present the full list of 20, or do you present some subset of what the user originally selected for them to rate? OK, this is a, a good question. The, the question is, uh, if you ask the person to select, uh, 20 quest to select 20 topics, do you later ask them the same 20 later? We actually use 16 to get this, but you could, of course, do more. Um, we, as a policy question, we just say the same ones as you selected during the authentication are the ones that you are asked later. Uh, you could ask a subset. You could even ask a superset. Uh, and the system could introduce other questions where if you don't have a strong preference for them, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, you will figure out if you slightly dislike it more than you do. Uh, then you dislike it. You might be a little bit puzzled because you don't recognize this question. But you know it's not going to affect your response to the other questions. This has a couple of benefits. Uh, one is that if you actually do express a preference, that's a new question that the system has an answer for you for. Another one is that it's, now it's going to be harder for the attacker to know. In the current system, the attacker would know that out of these 16, 
8 would be likes and 8 would be dislikes. But if we have kind of chaff questions entered there, uh, it's not so clear how many would be likes versus dislikes. Um, and the attacker would first have to kind of eliminate those or, or just have a, an optimal strategy involving all of them, and that becomes harder. So there are many um, kind of policy extensions to this. A last question? All right, then I thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.